Greetings and welcome to another episode of Emerging Tech Talk. I'm your host, Dan York, and I want to start talking about the Git distributed version control system. But to do so and keep this in my YouTube video length, I'm going to break this up into a couple different episodes. Today I'm going to talk about what are version control systems in general and where have we come from with those. And then I want to talk in the next episode about what is the Git distributed version control system. And then finally, I'm going to have a third episode where I talk about GitHub.com, which is a new uh, so website that aggregates Git repositories and works sort of like SourceForge used to in the open source development world. Now, if you're not a developer, you might be saying, so why should you care? Well, the reality is version control systems, or sometimes called source ma code management, but there's nuances there, um, they are systems for controlling or tracking revisions of a collection of files. Now, those could be source code. It could also be documentation. I've put entire books under version control. I've put uh, large blocks of XML files. I've put configuration files for systems. I have the whole Voxeo website under a version control system, um, or the blog site, I should say, the whole WordPress configuration. I've put a home directory under version control. So there's a lot of different reasons why you might want to use it. So to start talking about distributed version control, we first need to take a step back and look at what our traditional version control systems. And I'm going to talk here mostly about open source systems that have been around for a bit. So on my whiteboard here, let me just draw what a typical version control system might look like. In an environment, we would have a, a server out there that will have repositories of files on it. And what happens is on my local machine, I'm going to have some files, and I'm going to upload those into the repository in some way. So up here, there's going to be a bunch of files. Okay, it's going to have a repository like this, and there's some files in there. And then I am going to check out onto my local system a working copy of those files. So now I have a local copy right here of what's in the repository up on the server. And now I'm going to make some changes here. I'm going to add on to this file, and then I'm going to check those changes back into the repository, what most version control systems refer to now as a commit. So I'm going to commit the changes into the repository. And this is the workflow that I go through. I make changes here, and I go and then I commit those changes up into the repository. Now I might add additional files, so I'll add another file here. When I do my next commit, that file will now be in the repository. The repository serves as the master copy of all of my information that's there. And so, in fact, I could get rid of my local working copy and check it out again. Now, for a single person, this isn't, I mean, it's useful, but it's not as powerful as when you start working with additional people. So let's say I have another developer who's working with me on a team. We'll just call him Fred, okay? And he's going to go and check out a copy out of the repository as well. So he checks that out, and now he has on his system a repository with the files that are in there, okay? And he's working on things. And he'll go and he'll make his changes, and he'll commit them back. Now, how do we stay in sync? Well, most of all, the version control systems have some way to update your local repository. So I'll go and periodically I will update and I'll pull down a new copy of what was in there. So if I go and make some changes to, to one of these files, okay, and I go and add something in here, I then commit that back up to the repository. When Fred pulls down a copy, he's going to get whatever changes I had in there. So as I add more files there, as I go and um, you know, make changes, all of that will be reflected there. So I'll pull periodically, he'll pull periodically, and any other developers are working in here. Now, what happens, of course, if I go and make a change to one of these files, and so does Fred. Fred makes a change as well. And we both change the same file. Well, Sort of it winds up with whoever commits last, the one who has to figure this out. But if I go and commit my changes to the repository, all right, now Fred's going to go and do an update, perhaps, or actually he may not. He may just go and commit his file. When he commits his file, if Fred's changes in mind are in different parts of the file, say I changed a comment at the beginning and Fred changed something at the end, there's no conflict. The changes just get merged in, and that's it is committed proceeds normally. Now when I update my repository, I will get the changed file that includes both the changes I had committed previously and also Fred's changes that he's made. Now if Fred and I work on the same exact lines, well then there's a conflict. And what will happen is when Fred goes to commit that change, he will be told, 
there's a comment, there's a conflict, you must resolve it. And he'll have a choice then when he can go and resolve it and either accept the changes that I made or accept the changes that he made. You modify the file so it works and then he will commit back into the repository. So we both have working copies, we check them out, we check in our changes or commit our changes and we go with that. Now there's two other aspects we need to talk about here. One is, let's say I'm working in this and the code works great, but now I think there's a better way to do something. So what I'm going to do is I want to experiment and try out a new change, but I don't want to affect the main branch or the main trunk of what I'm doing. So what I do in the version control system is I create a branch. Now in, in the system up here that has our files, when I create a branch inside the repository, it creates a mirror image of that file, of that repository, that collection of files. And then I check out the branch and I work in the branch. When I commit my changes, they're going back into the branch. All of that's happening. Now, Fred could also check out that branch and we could be working the same way. So it all works just like working on the master repository. But now, once I've figured out that this branch is you know, it's good. I've refactored the code. It works much better. I like it. I want to use it. Uh, what I can do is then I can do a merge and I can merge this code back into the trunk, into the main line of the repository. So I can branch code off and then once I've worked with it, I can merge it back in. Now maybe I, the code didn't work. Well, I can just abandon the branch and so the branch just stays there in the repository. Some version control systems let you delete the branch, others keep it around, but whatever the case, I can just choose not to merge it back in. So I have repositories which might have branches and then I might merge those branches in. One last concept. So every so often I want to do a product release, version 1.0, version 1.1, 1.2, etc. I want to be able to get back to how my code was exactly at that time of the release. So I can tag the code in a repository with a given text string, you know, v1, v1.1, or whatever tag names I want to use. Okay, and what that will do is it will put a tag across all of the files in the repository so that then I can go back and check out the version 1.1 code as it was, or the version 1.2 and so on as you go through. So tags provide a way to get back to a, a moment in time within the repository and be able to revert to that. So this is how version control works. You have repositories, which might have branches, which you check code out, code out of, you, check, you commit it back in, potentially resolving conflicts, and you also can tag releases at a certain time. Now within the open source community, version control systems over the years have gone through a series of things. Probably the first one that was large scale was something called RCS, which was, it was version control on a single file. And in, in the 80s, there was CVS came out, the concurrent version systems, which took a collection of files. Then around 2000, a source code system called Subversion, or SVN, came out. And it improved on CVS, and be, and, but still there were a lot of limitations, and that's part of what Git solves. But Subversion, CVS, those are the major ones that people are using today in the open source side, and also in commercial sectors as well. Because even though they're open source, a lot of companies are using CVS and SVN for their internal code management. There are, of course, commercial products as well that do this. So what where does Git factor in? There's two fundamental problems with this picture. One of those is what happens when I... One of those is this. What happens when the network connection is severed? All right, I'm in a home office and I lose my network connectivity. Or I'm getting on an airplane and I'm flying across the country. Well, I can still work in my SVN repo, my working copy that's off here. But I can't actually check those changes in until I land on the other side and I can go and do that. Well, what happens if while I'm in the airplane, I make some changes that I want to revert, I want to go back to something? Or what happens if I delete out all my items? Okay, I, I'm stuck until I can get back on and get to a, con, uh, to a connection and get back to the repository. The other element is what happens if this goes away? Okay, the repository goes offline for some reason. Fred and I are stuck. We can't easily get the patches to each other. I mean, we can manually do it, but it's a pain to go and do. There's no way that we can check in changes. Those are two things that Git gets around in a way I'll talk about in the next show. Until then, this is Dan York signing out.